last night I watched a film called What She Said. Yeah. 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 That was a really good recommendation. Thank you for that. Um, do you want to introduce, do you want to introduce that film? Not to kind of put you on the spot. Um, yeah. I mean, it's pretty kind of, uh, it's a simple thing to introduce. So Pauline Kael, the film critic, it's a little bit of a, I don't want to say it's a, a biography about her, but it's kind of a, a slice of life about her as a person, her style, a lot of the people that she influenced and the people that careers got started by her. For example, Paul Schrader, who we all hopefully, you know, is the writer of uh, Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, and obviously his own filmmaker in his own right, First Reform, and uh, her unique style. And one thing that is unique about her, probably the most unique thing is that she didn't formally, quote unquote, get trained in studying film theory or the history of film. She was a unique voice and had a, a, had a unique way of saying things and made a name for herself. So the documentary kind of covers um, her life, uh, the people that she's affected, um, and also some of the people that maybe didn't think that she was great. Yeah. There's some, they kind of have, they balance that with some of that feedback. So um, it's a 2018 film. I think Rob Garver was the, he's the director of it. I think he'd, wrote it, produced it, did, did a lot, but um, I know it's on Amazon. I think it might even be on Hulu. So uh, pretty easy to find. Who else is good in the right. Pauline Kael. Yeah. She's never said a good thing about me yet. But that you like her. Dirty old broad. <laughs> Since 1968, Pauline Kael has written film criticism for The New Yorker. I understood her voice, and I, and I related to her voice, even when I disagreed with her. We grew up reading Pauline Kael. She seemed to notice everything. There is a sense that people really don't know what they believe in anymore. She turned the movie review into this expressive vehicle. It was as expressive as the short story or the sonnet. She said, I know that some of my reviews have sent people to bed for two weeks. Pretty sharp tongue. Who was referred to as that ghastly woman? There's very few critics who have the guts to go out there and write an honest review of a bad movie. She refused to be intimidated. Any woman in that position is going to uh, collect a lot of the animosity and really craziness that's out there. There's tremendous hatred of women. The, the real hate mail is for men, and it is vicious. <laughs> And there are a great many critics who are just trying to get through the day, who know they're second rate and who are scared of their editors and scared of their readers and scared of the movie companies. If you're good enough, then you bring something to a magazine or a newspaper, you bring it readers, and so you can hold your own judgment. If you're not good enough, then you're at the mercy of everybody and you have to give in. And so the point would be really to develop more courage. But she's probably the most qualified critic in the world because she cares about film and those that are involved in it. Uh, what did you think overall? Yeah, it was a good one to also recommend to watch it with Kendra. Uh, we, we both really enjoyed it. Um, and it was, when I, when I heard the name, I was like, is this the, is this the uh, movie reviewer that Tarantino always quotes? Like, I wasn't sure. And then that scene pops up where they're talking about band of outside band of outsiders, and that's how he finds his style. Um, I really liked it. Godard is the F. Scott Fitzgerald of the movie world, and movies are to the 60s a synthesis of what the arts were for the post-World War I generation. Rebellion, romance, a new style of life. Godard holds his cards face up to the audience. The most gifted younger directors and student filmmakers all over the world recognize his liberation of the movies. They know that he has opened up a new kind of movie making, that he has brought a new sensibility into film, that like choice, he is both kinds of master, both innovator and artist. There is a disturbing quality in Godard's work. His characters don't seem to have any future. They are most alive just because they don't conceive of the day after tomorrow. The one review Pauline Kael wrote that uh, ended up meaning something uh, to me in a big way. 
was for a band of outsiders. She said it was as if a bunch of movie mad uh, young French boys had uh, taken a banal American crime novel and translated the poetry that they had read between the lines. It was like, that is my aesthetic right there. That is, that's what I hope I can do. All those kids who used to go into the other arts, the brightest kids in America, the ones who used to become the architects and the writers and the poets, they're now going into movies. And I think they're going to bring new, more complex kinds of sensibility into movies. Look, watch. I saw a lot of connections where I like her way of thinking. I, I kind of saw some similarities in myself, not to toot my horn and sound like that guy. But I enjoyed that part of her experience is what's going on in the movie theater, you know, when she like reviews a film and the experience of the setting. And I just, those are all factors for me also, like ob observing that and taking that in. And then also, um, I liked the idea that she kind of had one foot in the door as a critic, and the other foot in the door as, you know, as an artist, kind of putting the same thing out there, putting films out there, you know, and writing and put her name on things. Um, it was really good. It was very inspiring. It was good timing with watching this film and everything else. It made me also watch uh, Slimelight, or should I say Limelight, you know? <laughs> yeah. She wasn't kind kind to that film. That was but my little bit on two. Another good uh, reason to to watch it now too is uh, there's a good crossover with Mank as well. Absolutely, of course. I, I think I brought it up in our discussion of it, but she wrote yeah. the famous Raising Cain uh, yeah. review that said that Herman Mankiewicz was the one that wrote yeah. Raising and Cain, and that Orson Welles was trying to get credit, which is obviously the premise of Mank. And then yeah. also another 2020 film. I'm thinking of Ending Things. Um, he in the car she quotes the woman under the influence review word for word that's Pauline Kael right man if you remember yeah yeah but it's pulling from different things he's got a Robert Zemeckis reference he's got yeah, yeah. a beautiful mind he's got you know even musicals yeah. and stuff but the what she says in the car about a woman under the influence is essentially line line for line the review of Pauline Kael so you can see even in, in 2020 she's still her influence is there. And obviously Quentin Tarantino is, is a big person. But one thing that I liked about her is just her being brutally honest and having her own style. And she wasn't respected by a lot of people. And, and one of the reasons I wanted you to watch it with Kendra too is part of the respect was because she was a woman, you know, reviewing movies. So yeah. she didn't know the things that a, a male would know. And they, they put up a bunch of different quotes and things like that. And she really had no, no formal training, didn't go to film school. Um, and just had something to say and had people that wanted to hear it, you know, yeah. people want, and I think that's the great thing about reviewing films or in a, in a uh, atmosphere like what we're doing is you don't necessarily have to be formally trained. As long as you have something to say and people that want to listen to what you have to say, you can create a career for yourself. And I really like the way that she created that path. And I get that question a lot as a, as a teacher of film is, oh, do I have to go to film school to become a filmmaker or to have a career in film? You know, we, we had the discussion a lot as well. And the answer is, it depends on who you are. There's a lot of people that they need that, that foundation. They need to create that network with meeting fellow classmates, uh, teachers and guest speakers that come in. And at the, on the other side, you have people maybe closer to yourself that are just hard workers, instant connectors, they are okay with hearing no, it won't stop them. They'll keep going forward. And you have those two avenues that, that you can take and there's nothing wrong with taking that, that second avenue. Um, but it does depend on who you are. I can't say that, oh, everybody's gonna have the same path as someone who didn't go to film school because you can think about Pauline Kael and Quentin Tarantino as a cool connection because they both didn't go to film school. Yeah. And they both created a path for themselves because they love movies, and they had something to say and had people that wanted to listen. Um, even Christopher Nolan didn't really formally go to film school either. So th there's, there's different paths. Um, and I, she, there's a quote that she says in there uh, when I think somebody criticizes her one of her reviews, she goes, you don't, have to, you don't have to lay an egg to know if it tastes good. So basically saying, that I don't have to be a, I don't have to go actually make the film to tell you that I know it's not great. And I, I used to use a similar analogy about uh, basically if you, you don't have to be a chef 
to know if something doesn't taste good, right? I don't know maybe the precise way that the food was made, but I can tell you if it's good or not. And I think that's the great thing about her and who she inspired. And um, even being the first champion of the film, Bonnie and Clyde, right? We, we talk about that movie. I talk about it in my class as 1967, American New Wave, one of those three films. It was Bonnie and Clyde, it was The Graduate, and it was um, Easy Rider. Those three really brought the American New Wave to light. But Bonnie and Clyde was not respected when it came out. And they said that her review really brought it to people's attention. And obviously the rest becomes history as it becomes part of um, essentially film history. Even Scorsese, I think her Mean Streets review boosted him as well. Yeah, got him and going. Obama, uh, I think they, they show that from the Fury, the images from, from the Fury, from yeah. Carrie, from Sisters, like she was a big supporter of him as well. So she had this cool way of just kind of supporting certain people. And yes, of course, Chaplin and others, she was brutally honest for her own. And that's the fun thing about watching movies is that you know, you, there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's, yeah. You you sparred off, so I had to make like little little side notes. I love in her house the setup she had, um, the tile in the kitchen from the movie The River. Uh, like right away when I saw it, I was like, "Is that from The River?" And um, it was cool to hear like the letters that they shared from all the filmmakers that wrote her and yeah. um, commenting like Spielberg let her know you figured out Jaws, and uh, it was cool when they also showed uh, that she really enjoyed The Last Tango in Paris. And then in my head, I was like, I didn't really care for that film. And it was just, everything was like really balanced with how they did the documentary itself also. You know, um, yeah, we're all entitled to our own opinion, essentially, you know. And it's just a nice perspective for, for people to see because I think film criticism is a real lost art form and the way that it's truly done. And again, I don't mean you have to have formal training and know about Eisenstein and film theory and Andrew Saris and all this, but to articulate what you think of a film is not as easy as you think. Because you, you, if you ask most people, what, do you, what did you think about the film? Almost, I can tell you, because I ask a lot, nine times out of 10, the first words they say is, if, if they enjoy it, I liked it. Yeah, yeah. And then they kind of just stop. Yeah. And then you got to kind of say, well, what did you like about it? And then they, they can kind of explain, yeah. but it's yeah. hard because it's such a weird experience to watch a movie is in, it's a lot of internal things. And sometimes the internal is hard to express externally where we try to say, well, oh, well it was, because most people aren't really aware of what they're watching in terms of the construction of it. Mm -hmm. They just see that it's, that it's like looking at a painting or a song. You're not looking at, oh, well, this is the note here or this is the color palette there. You're just watching it. But I think as film critics, people have to look at the construction, being able to deconstruct it. But also, again, going back to this Scorsese quote, don't think you got to know everything when you see it in the first viewing. And don't think it's got to be plus minus Rotten Tomatoes, you know, rotten or positive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be in that way. You can look at movies in, in a different art form. But when you look at places like Rotten Tomatoes, you see they got six, 700 reviews compiled on one movie. and. Yeah. You know, and people do what we do, so I, I can't say that that it's not something that that shouldn't be done because I think it's fun. But we also have to be able to decipher between someone who is articulating something about a film versus something that's just more feeling or opinion based. It's all going to merge together no matter what. Yeah. But she's she was one of the last few that does, and there's a lot of still film critics out there that. I think are respected. And there's others that people know, for example, Peter Travers, he's always very positive about movies. He's very yeah. supportive and that's yeah. his style. And there's other critics that maybe aren't as much, but it's a, it's a really unique world for me. I even thought about going into that world a little bit, just starting out in the field because I would, I reviewed movies really young. I was maybe 18, 19 when they were sending me to do uh, going to the proposition, going to do, oh, cool, going yeah. to waiting, going, and I didn't really feel like I fit in, but it, it really helped me understand. And a lot of my reviews are up, you can probably find them, but I don't think it's my best writing, but it was me kind of figuring out. And yeah. I would review DVDs too. I would review the special features, I would review the, so it's, it's a really fun world. And I hope more people enter it in a serious way and try to be in her, Kind of following her path because she's a really unique 
uh, way she's a really unique person in, in the way that she approached watching movies and also the way that she wrote about movies too i'm not sure which filmmaker it was but i don't even think they put his name up when he started talking it was like you either recognize him or you don't but he talked about her review made him stop making movies for a couple of years yeah i'm trying to remember who it was um a skinny it, uh, petite guy uh skinny and kind of petite fella i don't know but he his name never popped up when he said his thing. That's why I thought was really interesting about it. Cause I wanted to figure out what movie potentially, but he said, yeah, it, it affected me. It took me a couple of years before I had to make a movie again because of her review. And that was like pretty heavy, you know? It gets sensitive though. Cause think about just from the other perspective as a director, yeah, writer, you might put, look at what you're doing for your own film. You might put three to four years of your life, your blood, yeah. Yeah. you might put literal blood, literal sweat, yeah. literal yeah, yeah, yeah. years. Yeah, someone to just watch it after two hours and say it's garbage and this person doesn't know what they're doing. We will get defensive because oh, we spend yeah. so much time, so we care. So I understand both perspectives, but as a entering into that field, people should have thicker skin because yeah. you always you always gonna have somebody that doesn't like your work. You always gonna have somebody that loves your work. Like yeah, I was before to you. There's no movie in history that has been loved by everybody. And there's been no movie in history that has been disliked by everybody. So for as many people that think The Godfather might be the greatest film, I can find you people that don't like it at all and think it's garbage, think it's overrated. And you can say the same thing for Dude, Where's My Car? Someone right. might think that's, their, that's the best film ever made. You don't, you know what I mean? And most people yeah. might say, that's not a good film. Yeah. What do you think on her take of 2001 A Space Odyssey? um what did she say exactly I, I didn't i didn't get it like i i know they kind of said it but um everyone was obsessed about 2001 a space odyssey and then um she pointed out the one thing wrong with it which makes you no longer want to enjoy the film and she she essentially just kind of stroked the ego of man you know it's like a very simple plot i think is what she was kind of saying at the end of the day she was like kind of dumbing down the plot but um i just thought that was an interesting take like I wouldn't, even if I heard her opinion or her review on it, it wouldn't make me not appreciate the movie anymore. You yeah. know, that's all, that's all really. That's the thing too, is that we can compile all this information together and it shouldn't yeah. stop you from watching something. Right. That's the one thing that always bothers me about compilation of reviews is that yeah. it'll stop somebody from watching something. Yeah. yeah. And I understand that because we have so many options as film goers where we want to make sure that our time is being spent, right? If I'm going to sit there for two hours it's gotta be something good. It's gotta be something great. It's gotta be something that is one of the best films of the year. Yeah. But I, and, and for me, I don't, I don't really look at Rotten Tomatoes anymore. Now I just look to see, you know, who made it, what's the story about, maybe who's the lead. Is there any yeah. kind of unique things about the film to check out, style, the genre. And that's really what dictates for me. And, I, and I'm sure there's other people that, that, that do the same thing, but I just, the, the compilation of, of reviews becomes dangerous because it prevents people from seeing things. Yeah. And I think that's the, yeah. that we want to avoid is that's okay. Read the bad review, read the great review, but also have your own opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kendra's watching a show right now. It's like 20 episodes total, uh, 10 episodes per season. It came out in 2017. The second season came out in 2018. Uh, the show was canceled and no longer picked up. So I'm like talking to her and I'm like, what are you looking forward to? <laughs> you know, you're about to invest 20 hours or something that doesn't have an ending. And it's it's her, however you want to spend your time. And that's like more husband, wife talk, like you knucklehead. But, and that's like her, how she wants to spend her time, you know, and her kind of watch her storytelling. But I don't, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't really get that, you know? I mean, everyone has their different, um, yeah reasons for, for consuming entertainment you know Def, definitely definitely uh but i really liked the documentary i thought it was really well done uh it was really touching it made me feel really silly interviewing my grandma so old but to hear like the little girl interviewing her grandma kind of hit home i thought that was really nice um i love and even, yeah and her answers are really good oh well, that's what i was about to say is is um I forgot what the, I'm trying to, again, I don't remember exactly the line, but the, I think her yeah. grandson or granddaughter asked, well, go ahead. Favorite time, of your, favorite time of your life. Exactly. She's like, right now with you guys. Yeah. And they're like, what? Yeah. No, it was really cool. And um, yeah, I liked, I liked trying to spot all the films in it. And I was able to spot like 
probably 90% of it. And then uh, it was cool when they even show that she liked bad movies. You know, I mean, not, not, to, not to make me think of you in that way, but like you'll watch anything. Or if something's like, we hated that movie, we had to walk out, you're more likely to sign up for it sooner than the, you know, the big Marvel film for the weekend. I love that. I told you, yeah. if somebody tells yeah. me they hated a movie, yeah, zero percent, I'm more yeah. likely to watch that because I, I don't know, for me, I said this a million times, I quote, quote, Robert Altman, I tell you that you can learn as much from a bad movie as you can from a good one, because you can learn what not to do, how yeah. not to approach it. What did they do wrong? Where did it go wrong? And then you can inject that into your own career, whatever you end up doing. And same thing with a great film. Yeah, of course, you can see what they did great, and you, you get inspired by it. But bad films shouldn't be overlooked either. You have obviously Tommy Wiseau with The Room, yeah. Uh, Neil Breen is somebody that my brother and I are big fans of his work. One of his movies are absolutely horrible, but man, they're so entertaining. I mean, um, the last one that he did, it was called Twisted Pair. And I, I went with my father and brother and we saw it in a, at the Frida. And it was such a great experience because it was all people that were there for the same reason. They know it's not going to be a great film, but it was such a fun time to go yeah. and watch it. Now, is every yeah. bad movie going to be like that? No, there's a reason why people went to go see it. But I don't, I don't really try to let um, critics or, or anyone tell me I shouldn't see something and say, oh, maybe I, even things that we review, I try not to say, don't see it. Right. You know what I mean? Because yeah. everyone's got a different connection to, that's the beautiful thing about watching movies is that it's such a weird thing. I always tell my students the same thing is that we're we are looking at a screen how are we even having any emotional connection to anything it's not there it's not in front of us yet you will watch a movie and people will get scared they're going to cry they they feel the intensity they start laughing they start sweating they start you know holding on to their seats and yeah. it's not even there's nothing there but that's the psychology of watching movies is that our yeah. brain plays tricks on us and they say oh here's where we need to be scared Here's where we need to cry. Here's where right. we need to get excited. Here's where we need to laugh. Here's where we need to whatever. So I just think the, the psychology of watching movies is one of the most fascinating things. And that's that's really what should drive all of us is we can have a different experience watching the same movie. Let's talk about Hulk 2003, Ang Lee. Yeah. Yeah. I said that it's really underrated. I appreciate it a lot. You turn on and said, no, it's not good. <laughs> What I mean, and we yeah, agree yeah. a lot of things, but I know it's yeah. the beautiful thing. It's and awesome. You, you should always voice the thing that really, you know what yeah. I mean. So, yeah. I think it's I think it's a great documentary for anyone who is a fan of the history of film. Yeah. But also anyone that maybe wants to be a film critic, or even for females trying to enter the industry, she's one of the the pioneers of having to take a lot of bullets. Oh, yeah. you can't do it. You're this and that. As we know, even in front of the camera, behind the camera, it's not hasn't wasn't any better going through the studio era, 50, 60, 70. I mean, up yeah. until you know 2017, 2018 with that Me Too movement, it was a real struggle. And it still is for women to make film. But hopefully those struggles become less and less as new voices emerge and people realize that it's cool to have different voices. The same voices will make the same films. You know, new yeah. voices, new films. Yeah. Yeah, it would, have been, it would have been really cool to meet her or watch a movie with her or any or any of that. And I like that um, she asks before she shares her opinion, would be like a savage about it or just kind of share her thoughts. I like that she asked the person first, like, what do you think? <laughs> I think that's really cool. Yeah. I think, um, if I remember correctly, I think even in Birdman, there's a reference to her. Oh, it's really cool. Oh, at the bar, like, right? Like critics and yeah, yeah, yeah. I. I a little yeah. bit of a connection to her so she's yeah. been in in cinema and her dna is all over the place just looking at last year like we said with mank i'm thinking of ending things and you'll see it more and yeah. more you see with people like quentin tarantino who love her and respect what she did and inspired him you said band of outsiders i mean that's somebody that yeah. has become so influential and yeah. a critic kind of inspired her to inspired him to go and make that film or make his films yeah. in general become a filmmaker so i think she's like the quentin tarantino of film critics well i 
being a big Tarantino fan, he was obsessed about De Palma and he would um, be there the opening day of a theater. He would watch the first showing and then go with whoever, his friends at nighttime. But I remember him um, being on this big De Palma obsession with like sisters and any and blowout. And then it was really cool to hear that she was such a big fan of De Palma. And you're just like, these two are almost made for each other in their taste of what they like. Um, yeah, no, I thought it was a really, a really good documentary. Um, I like I like her ramble a little bit about um, the the reason why people men don't like her is because we're we're supposed to be at home we're supposed to need you and uh, you're supposed to kind of fill in that blank but she has an opinion and that kind of throws men off a little bit I think I think it was cool and she's strong man she's a strong woman yeah yeah and you're you're right about I mean just her approach is one thing but also like we said earlier is the people that she supported a lot of these names are all-time greats when you talk about De Palma, yeah. and Scorsese and Tarantino and De Palma got it he, he got a lot of slack early in his career because a lot of people thought he was just copying other filmmakers even you know you mentioned sisters they said oh you're just taking from Hitchcock and all these other things and she was somebody that said he's just inspired by them and he's creating his own style yeah. of film which obviously Tarantino and Scorsese are in that same boat so yeah um, yeah, she's her fingerprints are on a lot of great filmmakers. And Paul Schrader says in the th in the the uh, documentary that she got me into the into UCLA. She got yeah. me my job doing this, and she's really the foundation, the mentorship that I needed that got him into the you know, where he is today as one of the legendary writers and still actively making film. Yeah, it's awesome. It's cool. Uh, you're saying like we, it's hard to feel emotion from a screen. You know, like how can we feel emotion from it? Have you ever heard Tarantino ramble about like his goal with the audience in the movie theater is um, okay, laugh, 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 laugh. I want you to laugh here. Okay, stop laughing. Okay, I want you to be scared here. Be scared here. Okay, relax here. And like that is the feeling technically. It sounds really like bizarre where you want to make an audience feel that way, but that's essentially what it is, right? Like and then timing that visual component, you know. I mean, that's, that's the intention, but do the, does the audience also right. respond in the same moment? Are they scared? I mean, we want you to be scared, right? <laughs> and most great filmmakers, they'll probably get to that emotion that, that they're intending because they know how to do it through music, through performance, through image, right. production design, whatever. So right. yeah, that's, that's kind of the whole thing of making movies is laugh here, cry here, get scared here, feel a little bit of anxiety here because we don't know where the killer is or, you know, the, the car chase is, we don't know if what's going to happen. So I'm a little bit scared or it's a comedy. So laugh here, it's a drama. So this is the part where you cry. It, it's, it's weird how the, all those notes are hidden, are hit in a different way for many people. And not everybody cries at the same moment. Yeah. Like watch movies and something like the notebook, let's say that you have certain people that just, they're bawling at the end of it. They think it's, Oh my God, it's this yeah. and that. And you understand it. And then other people can watch it and they just, let's even let's use you and I as an, as an example uh -huh. I said when a parasite I was glued glued to my seat that I yeah. was almost paralyzed by what I had just seen because yeah, yeah. everything was just all the emotions everything yeah. and you said after it was done you just turned around everybody and said all right let's you guys ready to go right it was, so there you go. it was it was with Kendra and Shun and all of us were like it's pretty good you know, this is a pretty good movie. And then, and then like you hear more layers about it. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. That's yeah. fun. It is, it, it really is.